Okay, so, okay, am I blocking? Okay, so, uh, I guess thanks for coming. Uh, thanks to Spencer and Oldham. Oh, this is a very nice office. Okay, so my name is Raymond. Uh, I've been a software developer for uh, a long time. <laughs> so, Today's session is really about sharing with you about this thing called Cats. Uh, I wouldn't make any crude jokes, uh, but it's definitely not the musical. Uh, Cats is a project that, was, uh, that, is, uh, that has an umbrella organization called Type Level. I'm not affiliated to Type Level or any of the members. We're just friends who email from time to time asking te stupid technical questions and learning from others. So. Uh, can I have a show of hands? How many of you actually have uh, heard of CATS or Scala Z? Oh, wow. Really? I'm impressed. Okay, cool. So uh, basically today, I'm just going to share with you what I did over the past, past few projects about using CATS uh, from a sort of like a day-to-day -day basis kind of thing. Okay, about myself, I wrote two books, kind of stupid. One of them is Aka with, uh, I wrote it with Thomas Lockney. So we both, for a brief period of time, committed to the Aka repository way earlier when we were younger. So, yeah. So the other one was on uh, GPU. I got a bit crazy about doing GPUs back then in 2013. So somebody approached me for writing a book, so I did. So you want to learn about how to use OpenCL and, you know, make use of your GPU and turn it into a super computing machine. I have 60 algorithms written inside there, which includes the stochastic gradient descent algorithm. Okay, so let's jump quickly to the topic. Okay, CATS. Okay, before you learn CATS, there's a lot of acronyms you need to manage. They're called functors, applicatives, monads, monoids, semi-groups, validated. There's a lot of things you need to, to do. However, I can assure you the journey, right, after you sort of uh, understood what they are about, actually you can really sort of change the way you actually write applications. Okay? So, but you know, for me, I'm a developer. The first thing when I see the acronyms is really, I was panicking. I was like, what's a functor? What really is an applicative? Why do people say that applicatives are a monoidic functor? What does it actually mean? Today's talk is not about that, okay? I'm not a theorist, I'm not a programming language theorist per se, but I like to make my life easier. Uh, I'm already 43, I have an eight-year-old son, and I want to go home as early as I possibly can and be efficient, that's all. Okay, but first thing when you are understanding a functional programming language library like CATS or Scala Z, the first important thing you need to ingrain yourself is that they're really building blocks that really smart people uh, figured out such a very common pattern, lifted it out, and gave it a name. Some people don't like the name. Some people like it. Some people have no choice but to live with it. So the important thing here is actually the separation of concerns. So, you know, when you're writing code, right, it's always these three major things. You have, you have this first chunk of of code that does nothing more than just initialization. Then you drag data off from some storage or some, some RabbitMQ stream or somewhere. You move it into this huge memory data space and then you crunch numbers. And after this whole thing is over, the shebang bang is over, you need to decide whether to dump it or to store it somewhere else. If you look at how you do development, it's always these three critical phases, right? So. So, yeah, okay. In CATS, SCSI, Haskell, they bring in the concept of type classes. So you need to understand what is a type class. Does everybody know what's a type class? You know? Okay, so type classes yeah, came from Haskell. They decided that they wanted to, instead of, of Java, which in, it's like, uh, it's in Java, you inherit behavior, right? 
But then you discover this behavior is often replicated in other forms. For example, in, in Java, you always do equals, right? And then in some other case class in Scala, you have to say, oh, what does actually equal means for my case class? And so and so forth. So Haskell people decided that, at least that's my interpretation, Haskell people decided that we should have a unified behavior of what uh, equals mean. So that gave birth to the idea of a type class. So you have other type classes like uh, monoids, like semi-groups, like uh, functors, supplicatives. Those are generalized behaviors for how you want to manipulate your code in memory. So understanding this kind of stuff, it's quite critical that you understand the general idea of, of type class. Type class is more similar to Yeah, some people say, yeah. Yes, in a way, yes. So I would say uh, Scala is a bit of a it's, a, it's a very big language. And there's more than one way to write something. It becomes confusing over some time, uh, in a sense, right? Uh, initially, when, if you started programming Scala in 2008, people will tell you, oh, you need to use the cake pattern. Then once you pr put those co uh, code into production, right, 2009, somebody came out and said, it's a terrible idea. We should stop using it. So now it's 2017. Some people are still halfway in between. They say, OK, the cake pattern is nice. It works in the play framework. I don't see why it can't work anywhere else. I personally don't like the cake pattern because there's too much magic for me. So I like my types to be explicit, which is why I cause pain on myself. Because in a sense, if you have checked out, uh, Mao Sabin has this functional programming library called Shapeless. I think he took everything to the extreme in a sense that he built uh, this elaborate type system using path-dependent types in Scala to construct whole expressions to basically beautifully encapsulate the idea of, like, let's say, an algebra, in a sense. Sorry, I'm getting a bit too far. Okay, so uh, the next thing about, you need to know about type classes in Scala Z or even CATS, right? I just stopped saying Scala Z. Is that they have this thing, idea of a laws. Again, these laws are uh, inherited from uh, Haskell's concept, like functors as the identity laws, the, uh, the composition laws, etc. So you, when you're constructing your code, basically if you're a purist, if you're writing a library, you need to make sure that, um, that your code needs to have tests that covers and ensure the laws are item potent. Otherwise, uh, I, I recall there was a conference recently called FlatMap uh, Oslo. Uh, Daniel Spiewak actually uh, went online and, and asked, have you written, make sure that all your code conform to the laws before you publish it? So that's what I'm saying. Yeah, okay. So let's move on. Everybody's familiar with Scala syntax? Somewhat? Okay. So, <laughs> so this is, uh, in Scala, right, there's this idea of call a trait. A trait is a behavior. It is like, uh, people like to call it, it's, it, it is like a Java interface. So there's this idea of a semi-groups. So you need to understand, so we're going to go through, so let me maybe sort of uh, backstep a bit, uh, take a, a few steps back. We're going to go through some of the basic type classes. I'll show you some of the code I used to do. Some of my guys here actually used to uh, see that code I used to do. Yeah, so, but first we need to establish some sort of uh, terminology. Uh, so let's go through this thing. So semi-group is basically about semi-groups and monoids have a commonality. They are about combining things together. How do I know how to combine? In CATS or Scala Z or in any library, right? This is typically how you want to express how you combine two things together of type A. They call it a semi-group. So the difference between a semi-group and a monoid is that there's this thing called an empty method. Now, these kind of things uh, are very useful when, uh, when, for example, you have two uh, aggregator classes, right, that you need to aggregate. They have a lot of similar behavior, but you don't want to, but it doesn't have an initial element, which is actually present in the monoid itself, right? So, uh, I should, there's a disclaimer here. Uh, each of these type classes is already implemented in CATS itself, 
and default implementations are given to you. So there is always a semi-group for int, which basically means how do I do one plus one in int uh, in, in, as a semi-group. But you notice one, the, the, num the natural number one right, actually has a default element. It's actually number zero. So in that implementation, right, uh, the, in, a, in the monoid, which you will see in the next slide, actually there's a default implementation that says that an empty method for a monoid is actually uh, zero. So in this case, if you understanding that, you take a step back, you realize this is actually a much more generalized structure. It allows you to do combinations of two things. Later, I'll show you some uh, code of what it means. Hell, this is the monoid. There's no difference. And there's actually one difference, which is the idea of an empty method. Basically, it says, uh, tell me what is this initial element for type A. If it is an int, it's always a zero. If it's a Boolean, it will be the default, which is false or true, depending on how they write the structure. Yep. So, so far, is it okay? Okay. Feel free to stop me anywhere. So this is an example of how a monoid can be uh, invoked. These are the standard imports. Whenever you play with cats, you're going to have this. In Scala Z, it's always Scala Z dot underscore and then the capitalized Scala Z dot underscore. Now, there's a few things uh, you want to understand about it over here. Now, how this thing works in cats uh, is that it actually lifts the implicit, the implicit value that implements the monoid for string. This statement here, uh, this expression here, and then it knows how to combine a string. So as, as simple as that. So when you say a monoid of a string dot mt is basically the empty string because that's what it is. So this is a sugar syntax. Now when you're writing monoidic code, you can actually do something like that. It's a bit funny because uh, based on Scala's syntax, certain things are considered um, an identifier, certain things are considered not an identifier. So I know uh, at least one or two creators of the, uh, the shapeless library spent uh, maybe a year or so trying to figure out which operators actually are legal identifies and then trying to manipulate, uh, creating symbols, creating the methods for it. There's nothing special here. It based, uh, over here, if you've done enough Scala, you'll know that there's this method defined somewhere uh, inside the cats. It's actually, it's a type class, basically. And then it basically invokes. Because it solves, this, it sees this method, imp invokes the implicit for monoid and concatenate these two, times, these two guys. So that's how it can be done. So, the takeaway for monoid and semi-group is that it's for combining things. Pay attention, there is no order being implied. It can be combined in any other order. So, you, when you're writing a monoid that you want to combine things, you need to make sure that they can be combined in any other direction. That means... So, so, sorry? It's not commuted. Oh, yes, you're right. You see, I'm not a theorist. But in, in CATS, I realized when I was playing, right, there's actually, uh, you need to be careful about this when you're implementing, overriding your own monoids itself. There are some subtleties involved. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry? Associative. Sorry, come here. It should be yes, it should be associative. Yes, it should be. Okay, so. Uh, so what is this about? So basically, uh, one of the projects I was working on, basically I'm trying to tell, uh, give you an idea of what we're basically doing. So uh, I, I work in a trading company. So basically, there's a data stream of data of different types that is coming in. But they all have a, diff, uh, have a similar behavior. They're all carrying values, carrying something, carrying something. So when they hit the endpoint after we do a passing, we need to collect them in a sense. So these two data types are very similar in the behaviors, in the data that they carry. So our job is actually to do passing. So this is a very, it's like a pseudo code. Basically, there is this method, right, that collects the data types from, uh, from the stream itself, represented here by called data type A, data type B. Then there's an accumulator. 
Now over here, right, what, what basically what we've done is actually in the validated, uh, validate data, we basically do some validation and because it's actually, uh, it's, uh, it's actually um, doing, it will return basically uh, a left or a right. Uh, in terms of Scala syntax, it's actually the either dot left or the either dot right. So if there's an error, this is what we do. If it's not an error, this is what we do. So a lot of the code that we write are always in this kind of fashion, in a sense. So what we did is that, because we know that there are common, common parts inside the data types, right, we created this idea of a monoid so that we can copy the errors in, and then we can sort of put it into the accumulator. So the accumulator carries both the values and the errors at the same time. So this is what we basically uh, do, at least in this current uh, employment setting, is by creating, by leveraging, uh, creating an, a monoid for this data type and then initializing it and capturing uh, errors or values. That's what we do. Uh, any questions? Or is it like, hmm, what the hell is this? So, okay. Now, in validate data, right, it's actually an either type. So it either returns a left or a right. In cats, you can actually invoke the four. The four basically looks at the, the return value of valid data. And then if it sees that it's actually an error, I will apply this function over here. Now, this is an anonymous function. If I see that it's actually, oh, good. The, the data has been validated and has been passed. This is what I literally do. Okay, this is not the actual code because I have to skip out <laughs> some parts of it so that, you know, it's not meant to be aired in public, but, but that's a general idea. Okay, so far, any questions about monoids? So it's about combining things, combining. Okay, so the next thing is actually a functor. Hey, sorry. Ah, okay. Okay. So, so for more noise, right? Basically, you, there are actually two ways you can do this. Uh, let's say if you're using a repo, you're playing with it. If you invoke the colon and then implicits, right? It will lift out and show you what are all the implicits for the more noise that is being shown on the repo itself. The second way is actually to read the, the source code for the cats itself. The instances, there aren't too many of them. There aren't too many of them, uh, but the defaults are always uh, being implemented. The usual primitives, the strings, booleans, uh, for lists, sequences, etc. Collections. collections, the collection stuff. Think so, yeah. Oh, okay. Okay, so the next thing is uh, functor. So, so what's a functor? Just have you heard of functors? So functors is nothing more than something that can be mapped over. It, so, but I'm actually trivializing this whole thing. What it actually does is that, you're, what we are trying to say is that there's a functor that takes in a type parameter that, that has a hole inside. This thing is called a hole. So actually you come across them all the time. They are lists, right? A list of ints, a sequence of ints, a vector of ints, an option of something. They are all, they conform to this type uh, signature because there's a hole inside. That means I know the outside, which is an option, a list, but I don't really know what's, what you're carrying inside that value. Now, what this signature says, if you give me this thing of type A, and you tell me, you give me a function that transforms the values inside here from A to B, I'll, I can give you a B, F of B. So it means if I have a list of integers, you give me a function that transforms integers to uh, strings, I can actually do it for you. It's called functor. So in cats itself, you can see that that's what they always say. It's something that can be mapped over. So if you use like options, futures, you must have come across this. It's just that maybe you don't know the terminology, but that's what it is. Because, uh, so I, I should sort of explain uh, why you need to know the terminology. It's because if you go onto Gitter, anyone, everyone has used Gitter, right? If you go to the type level site and you start asking them, right, 
they will ask you, oh, uh, can you show me your bifunctor code? Uh, are you talking about this applicative? You'll be like, what? So, I mean, what, what I'm trying to say is that in order to communicate with them, there should be some terminology that you can sort of communicate. Because these guys are like type people. They're like type people. I had to like show them code and I was like, oh, you mean it's a... I was like, oh, that's what you call it. Yeah. Then by the time it'll be like 1 a.m., I'll be like so sleepy. Yeah. So... Now, the first thing is, once you understand this concept, you actually know that they're actually very common structures. They're very common. Actually, you've been using them when you're starting using Scala. They are already there. It's just that, uh, I, I don't know how they, uh, uh, I mean, Scala was developed much earlier than CATS. So they don't have the idea of generalizing it to, into a functor. So they call it a map. You will see it in your Scala uh, documentation uh, on your browser. They're actually very, they're very commonly used in this thing called recursion schemes. I learned about this uh, this year when I was with Herdi at Scala Matsuri and uh, Powell, uh, this Polish guy, Powell, sorry if I cannot pronounce his name correctly, he gave an excellent talk about recursion schemes. So they, they're actually very, they're used really frequently. Yep. Okay, let's have a look at an example. Okay, functors. Whoa, what is this thing? Again, it's the usual uh, imports, and what does this thing do? Now, this is an, an idea where it's actually lifting a function to be applied to a list. Now, when you create something like that, you actually have reusable code. When you create this thing, it will work for any list of integers because you already gave it, you already told it what it needs to do. You basically lifted this function and say that whenever you see a list of integers and I want to apply this, apply this function itself, this is the function you need to apply for me. So when you, when you sort of go through, uh, you know, and what happens is that when you apply it to a list of one, it will actually give you a list of two. So the functors are actually very common structures. You actually do them all the time. It's just that you don't know they were there in the first place and how you can actually create reusable code. Because what we... What you notice once you learn about how to lift functions and then so that they live inside a context, this is what they call a context, you can actually create a lot of reusable code that people can go share because you've already done it for them. Okay. So far, how is it? It's like complete blur. I don't really care. I just came for pizza or something like that. <laughs> okay. All right, we're coming to the next part of the talk. It's called monads. All right, Martin Odersky said it, said it very nicely in this year's Scala days. It's for called sequencing computations. Sequencing. When I first started out uh, with uh, CATS and Scala Z, when I look at this thing called the monad, I was like, what? You see a lot of blog posts talking about, oh, you can do this, you can do that. It's like, okay, so what's the whole point? Um, uh, to be frank, I didn't get, quite get it uh, back then. So later on when you, you know, the funny thing is how I learned about this is actually I, I went to study Haskell, then I realized, oh, so this is what you meant. Yeah, so yeah. I'm not asking you to study Haskell, but I find that it's very beneficial if you study Haskell so that you can go read somebody else's code. So it's meant for sequencing computations. So what actually does it mean? Monads is nothing more than flat maps. You're just flat mapping, flat mapping something. So this, uh, uh, you must have seen, you must have done this, right? Have you done this before? You have some list, you flat map, and you say, oh, I have two lists. I want to create tuples of this list. I go through them. I iterate, iterate, and I create a tuple. I always do this. Now, the nice thing about flat maps is actually, it actually helps you to short circuit your computation because this can never be created if either this or this is empty. Right? So it's a nice way to say uh, something about your computation. Right? I mean, in, in, of course, in Java, you can say the same thing. If this, if this is empty and this is empty, don't do something, don't do something. But it's kind of ugly. So it's one way you can do it. So this is the point I was trying to iterate. Monads is good for short-circuiting of your computations. Okay, 
So monads is about sequencing. Eh? So just remember that it's about sequencing. Taking something at the top and then saying, oh, I have a value. And if there's a, something at the bottom, I'll pass it to the guy on the bottom. And the bottom recursively computes, oh, I have something. I'll pass it along. I keep passing it along. This is a quick summary of how many kinds of monads are being supported in CATS. I actually left out one. It's called RWST, which stands for Reader, Writer, State, and Eval at the same time. Uh, they inherit this thing from the Haskell side. So you will see a lot of people talking about a writer monad, a reader monad, a, stat mo a state monad, and an eval monad. So this one, I don't really use it because I replace it with uh, implementations like uh, Monix, if you want to, because they have actually a much more mature implementation, in a sense, uh, much more featureful. So I mean, we can go through what, what this actually means one by one. So that's a writer. Writer really is about carrying some information along with your computation. Readers, I can tell you, you've encountered readers all your life. It's just that you don't know that they are called readers. Later, I'll show you. Readers compose operations that depend on some input. The state monad basically allows you to say, I, want to, I have a state at this part of the computation. Once this thing succeeds, I want to pass this state along to the next guy to compute based on what I've done in state step number one. And that's how it's being propagated. Some people will tell you, once you start using this thing, they say, please avoid using the writer monad because it is not safe. Uh, I think there's some merit to that argument. Uh, I'll show you uh, sort of an example why it, in some use cases, is good, some it's not so good. Okay, but let's familiarize ourselves with what we can do with the monad. Again, let's have a look. Whoa, what the hell is this thing? It's nothing more than two graded signs and followed by an uh, equal operator. This is what they call the bind operator. It's really a flat map. Now, how did they call this? They didn't invent it. It was invented by Haskell. So now, if you look at the whole chronology of events, uh, the guys who created Scala Z were Haskell guys. The guys who created CATS uh, took a lot of ideas inspired by the ideas from Scala Z. So a lot of terminology sort of was being passed down. It's like a state monad. So what does it say? So this syntax actually follows Haskell. If you've done some Haskell, you'll know that uh, on the left-hand side, it's the object or the containers, and there's a function and returns me a container. The containers here, for this to compile and run, this must match this because it's meant to be a monadic computation and the types needs to be, on, needs to be the, the same. Now, this is just a very simplistic view of this whole thing because you actually can chain them together. You can chain a lot of these kind of bind operators together as long as you return me a list. So this is what it basically means. I lifted this off from the, uh, uh, the, the monad uh, tray in the cats, so you will notice that, okay, I'll, by itself, it, it doesn't actually work. So what it basically means is that when on the left-hand side, when I see a container, imagine this is a list of integers, you tell me a function, I know that, oh, you want me to convert elements of A into a list of B, for example, in this case. I can tell you how to do it. You will see a lot of these type, type signatures, right, uh, littered all over cats. Because these guys are, are so expert at lifting and abstracting computation, it, it, will, it probably will take you a while to figure out how, how these things work. But on the right-hand side of the equal, really, is a flat map. This is the same as a flat map. So the next time, some, you know, when you go talking with you know, the gurus on the type level, Gitter channel, you'll be like, oh, you're talking about the mine. Oh, you're talking about the fish. Oh, OK. Yeah, you're an expert, uh, look like an expert. Okay, the next thing, lifting. All the type classes in CATS or SCSI or in Haskell or whatever it is, have the ability to lift functions for the outer containers. You can actually define something like this. You can say, this is a function I want to, to, to be applied whenever you see a list or something. So when you do this, what happens is that, again, when you say monad of list, the implicit is being invoked. 
and you say, oh, okay, and you will look at this expression and know that, oh, it's an int that returns an int, or I, I have the kind of implicit, I'll let you pass. And then you can actually pass in the list of integers and you return you 2, 3, 4. In my own experience, I find that type classes really helps me to uh, define a lot of reusable code because most of these things, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's like what I said at the beginning of the talk, it's always the three phases. You take something out from storage, you do something with it, crunch it in memory, and then you decide whether, whether to chuck it or, or do something else. Yeah, yeah. This is a function from int to int. Yeah. Should it be a function from int to list of it? Ah, okay. This is the handy syntax they have given you. Yep. So, uh, by the way, because this one is actually, uh, it actually uh, doing this thing called flat mapping. So if you look at the code, right, actually, uh, yeah, I know it, it sounds a bit funny from what you saw in the previous slide. How many implicits are involved? <laughs> oh, we have an expert on implicits here, actually. He's sitting right at the back. <laughs> There's actually a lot of implicits involved. So you will find that when you're programming cats, at least if you're using Scala 2.11.8, you need to import Miles Sabin's uh, compiler fix. Otherwise, uh, some of the types don't actually match. It's actually a deficiency in the Scala compiler as of the version 2.11.8. But when I tried using 2.11.11, it seems to be okay. Yeah, so I mean, the rest of the world is moving towards 2.12, I assume. So, should be fine. Yeah. What's the archetype of a lib? So, when you give it the function from um, into it in this case, like what is the signature of uh, whatever it is? Oh, good question. I can sort of apply to it yeah. and then get another list, but what is I, the term of yeah, I think it's, it's a. a function of in to, to model of in. in uh, yeah. Oh, so what you can do, actually, I'll be making these slides available uh, on the meetup site or wherever Hurry wants it to be. Uh, you can go, uh, I'll post some, actually there are some links behind where you can learn more about uh, cats per se from this guy, this clever guy called Mr. Eugene Yokota. Yeah, I, I don't know whether you know him. Uh. Have you heard of him? SPT guy. Uh, who was the guy who said it? Yeah, he's the SPT guy, sorry. Yeah. Sorry, do you have a question? Okay. Ah, okay. So the next thing about this uh, type classes is the idea of lifting any ordinary value into a monad. Now, so far, if you look at the previous presentations, right, the previous slides, it's all about, okay, you, t you give me something, and I'll try to apply it to a list of something. But what if I have this thing, let's say an integer over there, but I want to be part of a monadic computation. So what should I do? Now, all the type classes in CATS actually have a similar behavior to Haskell. It allows you to lift. That means lift a plain value. This actually, again, it's, uh, it's from uh, Haskell. A poor name in my opinion. But it basically says that, oh, I have a f number four. I want to lift it into become a monad so that it can participate uh, in a monad computation. You'll find this very common when you're creating your own code. Like you have like a, okay, a stupid example, but let's say it's a user class, right? A user class. It's a plain case class. Most of the time, it's modeled as a case class, and you want it to participate in some sort of computation. You have to lift it in. If you write uh, cats in the uh, flat mat style, you actually need to do this kind of stuff so that you can lift it in to participate in the computation. Uh, we'll go through the, what I mean uh, shortly. Okay. Uh, yeah. So this is, uh, this is an example of monadic flows. Now, when they say a monad can sort of flow the context, they basically mean it can actually flat map. So what happens? So what is this? Uh, def first, I just gave it a name because I'm not really good with names. This is a reader monad. A reader monad always takes in one argument of some type and returns a monad. So that's what a reader is. Now, what I'm saying here is that, what I'm saying here, let me go through this. Huh? So I, I, I want to take an int and I give you, this is a repeat. A repeat basically says that uh, if I see a true, give me a list of, uh, a list of x, 
if I see is uh, you know if it is true also, give me um, the list of x as well. This is what it means. Okay, so this <laughs> these two are the same thing. I it wasn't my intention to confuse you, but they are the same thing. Now, what happens is that when you put it into a modernic computation, what it actually does is that when you invoke first and give it a four, it will give it uh, two lists. But because it's a, sorry, a list of two values, and because it's a flat map, it has to you know, go through each element of the list and does the same thing again, you always see four elements. right? Because flat map is always O of n squared. So this is a slightly more complicated example of using monads. Uh, a monad that is, uh, uh, that is called a reader monad. And you can actually compose them. Okay, so next thing is called a writer monad. Writers are meant to carry not only the information about uh, uh, the computation, but sometimes how you compute it. Okay? This is an example I lifted off from Eugene's uh, website. It's called Herding Cats. Uh, this page I actually can understand. Some of the other pages, I'm so sorry, some of them are really way beyond me. But this page actually was, was quite illuminating in the sense that uh, what he did was this. He wanted to create a computation, right? This is the, the end part of the computation, but he wanted to say, whenever I have a number, I just want to log the number itself. Now, writers allows you to do this. So how does he do it? Writer always carries some information and then the value of what is being computed. It is a very simple example here, but at least what, it, what we've done uh, back in what we're doing here right, is, is this. Has, is everybody familiar with the idea of a correlation ID? A correlation ID in the HTTP world is an ID to uniquely identify a particular request. Normally, it's embedded into a HTTP header and used widely in uh, you know, web contexts, right? Now, this is, the, this is the thing. When you're writing code in Scala, right, you'll notice, especially when you, when you write code in Akka, the logs are always interleaved. They're always interleaved. I can never understand whether this transaction was coming from that guy or not. Even if I have the correlation ID, I spill it onto the logs, I'm still confused. So what, what we basically do for the writers is that we create a, an idea of a writer monad and we pass this guy around in each step of the computation. And we use the writer to accumulate the logs. So in the end, we don't really need the correlation ID. We just spill and, and then voila, each transaction is perfectly captured. And when it spills out, because writes is basically atomic, so when you collect them together in the same object and you spill them onto the Akka log, they will always appear as something like that. Now, why do we do a very stupid thing like this, right? It's really because we actually have an um, uh, elastic search, the ELK stack that is reading off the data from these logs and then pushing them off to somewhere. So they need to be in this sort of format that is being spilled uh, in exactly the same order that it was being computed. So writer monads can help you to do this. Now, now, that's really a side story. So let's come back to this story. Now, in the log number, what he actually did was to illustrate the very uh, idea that the monads can actually be composed. So this is the, the usual, your favorite for expression. Basically, it does, what it does is actually go through, you know, uh, give me the log, log number of three, log number of five, and then when you run, this is their syntax. I don't know why they want to do this. You can choose not to do the run, you can just invoke. Run is being called implicitly, and you can see that the logs is being spewed out. So it respects the order of the computation because the order is actually implied here. Okay, so when you're writing complicated monads, uh, writer monads, it will ask you to give it a, a monoid. Oh, a good catch. Okay. Yeah. Is what? Log number, second line, it always returns three out It it is a trick they did to make sure you're paying attention. So when you do this, what happens is that the tree gets placed over here. The value is always extracted onto the left hand side. 
and the lock stays inside this context. It doesn't reveal itself. You can force it to reveal itself if you want to. So this is an example. Like, the nice thing I like about writers is that I can actually reset it. So by resetting it, right, I basically clear out the, the locks. It was here. This is still the same object. Mount with lock, mount with lock. So it's kind of nice for certain computations. Or you can do a swap. I don't really use this, but you know, it seems to be, I, I'm pretty sure that it's useful so for some people's use cases, but at least I don't use it. The nice thing is that, uh, that I like is that you can actually extract the value. It's always the right hand side of the tuple here, right hand side over here, and that's the written. That's what they call it, the written. You can see it from here. So it's very good. Like, for example, later you see why this is important uh, when I sort of introduce F monads, because uh, I can actually have the same computation that carries the log, and I can choose whether to run it with logging or run it without logging just by switching it. That's all. So we'll come to that later. Okay. So far, is it, is it okay? Is it like, like, oh shit, I need to get out now. Okay. Okay, so reader monads, you've been seeing this all your life. Okay. Reader is, it's very simple. Uh, so let's, let's use this, uh, use this um, uh, example. Now, normally you have, uh, in this example I'm giving you, is that there's a config class. You just imagine there's a config class, right? You always do the usual thing. Get a setting, get the bloody value, etc. But it's like I'm always, if you, if you look at your own code, right, you'll be like, uh, oh, this config class for certain people have to behave in this way and that way. Readers gives you a way to abstract it out in a sense that, okay, I, give me a name, a meaningful name that's recognized in your application. I know that I'm going to get a, a config and you just want the setting. I'm going to give it to you. This is called a reader monad. You've been using this all your life. But, you know, there's another way to write this. Now, the nice thing about reader monads is that it can be composed. You notice, uh, I'm favoring one style. The full comprehension. Uh, one major reason is because I find that it's very readable when I read it like this, because I know that it's always, oh, okay, if I find this and I find this, I'll get this. So it's always very real from a top to uh, down kind of approach. You, you are free to choose any other style you want, but, you know. Okay. So far, it's okay? Okay. State monad. It, it, this is, seems like a paradox, right? Am I trying to trick you or something? It allows us to pass state information around in a computation. A state monad passes state information in a computation. Let's look at a, an example of a state monad. This is an application I built recently. Uh, it follows the style that you've written before. Uh, let's focus on this. This is a state monad. Now, a state monad basically says, uh, give me a state. You do something with it. It's a function that takes a state. You do something with it, return me the new state plus some value. That's what the state monad is. Now, in this case, what I'm choosing to do is that I just want to do two very simple things. I have a config. I have a config class, which is the same, uh, which actually is a type safe config. If you've used it, I'm sure you've used it already. And I just want to make some alterations to it, and I want to load and store it. But I don't want to do anything else. A state monad gives me that kind of flexibility to write very clean code to do that kind of thing. Now, typically what happens when you're starting to code a state monad is that you normally have some abstraction to say that it's a state. So when you init a config state, like for example over here, right, I'm, in, I'm, I'm initializing uh, the config state by passing something from uh, a previous computation. I pass it in and it gets stored, right? Then after that, I can command it to load and store and as I'm altering. Now, how is this important? I'm, I was writing a DSL. Funny thing is that it's a D XML DSL. What I'm doing is that uh, as I'm processing this domain-specific language that is written in a DSL, I need to say, oh, when I see uh, there will be a default state for this whole language, but when I see certain elements, I need to say, okay, I will ignore or I'll override your state. And I need to store it. 
So this abstraction gives me the, the flexibility to store and load it. That means if I see something nested within the XML config file, and I see that, oh, okay, you didn't override it, I will load whatever I last saw, and it will be applied. If I saw in the XML, nested XML, that you chose to override it, I will store, because you wanted this new state to be the new one. So it's, that's how it typically works. Now, this is very simple, uh, regular. Uh, again, you can see that I favor this kind of uh, for comprehension style. So what I do is that I extract the groups. Uh, this is basically a whole language that extracts data off from an XML configuration and manipulating the state so that it can be applied in nested elements, etc. So uh, if you read, I mean, I think I, I write reasonable good English. What I normally, do, what, what I did is I extract everything, certain things I'm looking out for in the XML and this returns me a list of something. I go through, that means by doing this notation, I iterate through all of these things that I was looking for, I call it a group, and I load the config. This is a nested XML configuration. I use this function to load it and it can, to get the config. And then from there, I configure it. And then I load again and I do something else with the state. So when you're writing later on, uh, when you get more familiar uh, with CAT, you'll be writing in a very similar style, I'm pretty sure. And what I want, the whole point of this slide is actually to illustrate two things, is that the reader actually is much more powerful than what we last saw. You can actually do lots of lots of different things with the reader monad. Because remember, the reader always takes in one argument of the type, and you return a monad. A monad. A yield always returns a monad. So the general structure is always there. Then what you do inside, you can lift it out into other abstractions. What kind of monad can you Just a reader or something else? Anything. Yeah. Okay, so here's the trick. The trick is when you do yield, right, the Scala type checker makes sure that all of the types must conform. So you will see this notation to option, to option, option, option. I'm forcing it. I'm forcing it to become a monad. I'm lifting it. Remember I was talking about lifting values, plain values, and I want to be part of a monadic computation? I lift it. This allows me to lift it. When you're doing cats, you will, you will know this. Uh, any more questions? Okay. Okay. The two things I like about this is actually the separations of the concerns and basically the state management. I, I find that this sort of way, uh, actually, uh, I'm not the first one to actually come up with this idea. I basically went to read uh, Timothy Parrott's uh, uh, blog about how to utilize state and, and, and combine it with algebraic data types. Uh, he came up with this pattern. I was like, oh, okay, that's very useful. So, yeah. Okay, so far, everybody still with me or are you like, God, this is hot. <laughs> okay. okay, so the next thing is actually called an applicative. Ah, applicatives, actually I didn't quite understand it uh, at first, but basically it's like, um, just now you, you learned about functors, right? You learned about functors. Functors basically allows you to map a function over something, a container of something. Applicatives allows you to add function application, but allows you to expand the, the scope which you apply the function, which means I can do list of list of function to something. Functors can't really do that. Let's look at example. In functional programming terminology, they always tell you an applicative is actually a functor. They always tell you applicative is a functor. Hopefully, uh, you can see why. Uh, if you flip back to, if you can recall, right, back in the previous slide, I actually replaced this guy with functor. It was actually doing the same thing. Applicatives are also doing the same thing. Now, this is a slightly more elaborate example that uh, tells you that actually I can apply a function to a list of something, a list and a list of something. So applicatives are good for that when you have two layers. 
Founders, one layer. So for me, that was the easiest thing that I could understand when I was going through uh, CAD, Scala Z, and, and etc. Now, this example over here, uh, basically, it's, uh, it's, it's actually uh, using one of this thing called the uh, nested function, a uh, nested data type. In CATS, right, you don't really have to write this kind of expression using an applicator. You can if you want. But in CATS, they have this thing called the nested. The nested structure is basically the same. It's a nested functor. It's a functor and a functor, and then you can functor and a functor. Because sometimes you actually have very complex abstractions built in inside something that can be mapped over, in a sense. Yeah. So we have a list of ints and a list of functions of ints to ints. Yeah. Uh, but in this example, all the lists are not in one element. So, sorry, come again. In this example, all the lists are one element long. What happens if the lists are longer? It is okay. Uh, uh, no, it doesn't permit it. So the, um, when you have, uh, so far it's for, you are talking about this function here. Is that what you're referring to? What happens if the second list for the functions contains two functions? Oh, if the second list has, oh, then you have to lift it up. Oh. So you have to, so this, this will represent the list of the function, then you have to lift it out again. You can map. Because functions are actually functors, you can map again. It depends on how complex this structure is. It's already in complex enough. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, the one question, actually to follow up on this question, the one question I discovered is that um, how come uh, you know, those guys only uh, develop until like two contexts? That means the, the depth is always two. Uh, turns out there's, uh, actually there was a logical reason. Uh, all the applicatives somehow can be reduced. And this is the, um, after flattening all the applicatives, this seems to be the uh, common pattern. That means you don't need to account for the third list of list of list of something. Because after you flatten, uh, the maximum it can go to is always these two contexts. So maybe that's why they didn't ex, you know, expand further and say applicative over applicative over applicatives. Sorry. Ah, yes. Okay. Okay. A lot of people use it for different uh, various reasons. Uh, at least the ones that I've used applicatives for is actually to do uh, validate of configuration. So let me show you an example. Okay. Okay, so now there was a purpose to, of me putting this slide in, but then I realized it was a mistake. So I'm going to skip this slide. Okay, let's jump to this. Uh, some of my ex colleagues probably have seen this code before. So uh, this is an example of how we use applicatives to validate fields in a configuration. Uh, let, me, let me sort of uh, give you a background. We're basically, uh, we're programming using the ACA. So ACA uses the application.conf. It's written in a whole con syntax. So it's like a, it looks like a JSON kind of structure. We actually have some configuration embedded. It's our own custom configuration. But I didn't want to use, back then, uh, type safe stuff. Because I was like, oh, you know, I know about applicatives. So I might as well use the concept and try, and, and try it out. So. Having said that, basically, this is the embedded, uh, this is the object that I used to represent something, uh, a sort of business domain object in the application. Now, for this thing to, for, to create this kind of uh, uh, config, right, I need to make sure that the, the name of the caster is actually a string, the port needs to be an int, string, and string, and so on and so forth, right? They are very, very basic stuff. So, what we've done is basically, we have this, the usual stuff. It's basically just a regular Scala object of any name. And I want to say, get the half config from the type safe config. That means I read it off. I, you just tell me. You just tell me whether, you know, it, is, it, is it correct or not. And what I do, what I do is that I, I, give, it, um, I give it two types. First is collect all the errors for me. And then if there are no errors, give me the, the end value. The end value actually is 
the half config itself. So I don't want you to be too bothered by the syntax over here, but let's try to grasp uh, what, what was I trying to do. I was trying to say, go read the configuration inside the application.com, lift out all these keys for me, and validate that they are strings. So there's a bunch of code that is missing over here, which I cannot show you, but they're pretty boilerplate. But what this, this basically means is that lift this key from the application comp, make sure that it's a string, because I say it is a string, I already explicitly say it's a string, and pass it for me. There's an object somewhere, which I have hit it, that passes this thing to make sure that it's a string by checking for it, is it A to Z, is that a regular expression, A to Z, or capital A to Z, that's that kind of stuff. And this is what I do. Now, when this thing is being validated, basically when I call this function over here to validate it now, it basically collects all the errors uh, and all the, all the successes and save. And what happens is that I collect all these things together and I basically map it out. If, you see, if this configuration is correct, you will collect all these things in a tuple for me and I create my case class. This is what it is essentially doing. Don't bother about, don't, don't have to be too uh, bothered about uh, what does this actually do. This basically says that I want to apply five computations to it using applicatives because five here, when you, if you indicate, uh, let's say six or four, et cetera, right, there will be a compile time error. It will make sure that there are actually, when you say that there are actually five uh, applicatives inside, I will make sure that there are five over here. So that's how the validation is being done. So they are very good in doing this kind of stuff. So what, any questions on, on this snippet? Is it like, wow, shit, what the hell is this? What did I get myself into? Where is the applicative here? Sorry? Where is the applicative here? All in this one or all five of them? Ah, uh, that's a good question. So what happens is that, um, apply is a base trait which all the applicatives inherit from. So what happens is that for the apply, what happens is that this thing invokes the implicits. It invokes the implicits for validated now. It, it basically says, this is the non validated non-empty list. It basically says, apply all these functions, collect all the errors for me, and this is the end result. This semicolon refers, uh, sorry, this question mark, sorry refers to this. This is what it basically means. Yeah, okay, I won't go into this, but... So why is it called map? What is being mapped? What is being mapped? So, what happens is that in applicatives, right, what they basically do is that they apply this particular function. So, this function will give it either a left or a right, as in an either type. Then, through invoking to validate now, it will say, oh, it's a left. It's an error. It's a right, I'll let it pass. But these, these guys, it, at least on theory, applicatives have the ability to be parallel. So all these things, these five expressions over here, are potentially parallel, theoretically. It is not in the implementation. Wait, uh, so the is enclosed in the outer scope of the applicative. It's not the argument to the mapping function, right? So you're not having so arguments to map are not functions, not the mapping functions. Uh, not the mapping functions. Yes, 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 yes. Yes. So I should say this this is the function. Because you did um, uh, uh, the passing function is being hidden, so you can't see it over here. Okay. So parse doesn't return a value, it returns a function to apply to it, it returns either if I remember correctly. If I remember correctly. It's been a few months since I... Sorry? Sorry, come again. It, it, it says it returns two validated non-empty Yes. It will return, a, 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 basically it's a validated now. And inside the, uh, inside the map five, it actually evaluates the five validated nails and sees whether to return the tuples itself. Yeah. So I, sh I should say, um, I actually made a quantum leap here. Because there's a concept in CATS called the Cartesian. The Cartesian is basically cross product, which the apply is based on. So it's like a cross product and it's, it's 
what happens is that it treats this thing like a cross product and it's performing all these competitions and then lifting out the values for you. Yeah. I think we have, I, I can't remember who was the guy who created the first validated library. But, but I know that it was a recent invention. It wasn't like 60 years ago. I can't remember. Functions almost the same, so you yeah. validate things in parallel, and then you just collect all the results. Yeah. If all passes, you get the actual form data. Otherwise, you get a list of errors. Ah, okay, yeah. So this allows me to quickly find out, like for example, if my if I enter a wrong type, let's say for cluster name, I gave it a number, it says, oh, it's not, it's not a valid string, or something like that. Okay. So that's the validation. Oh, okay. Now, we come to monad transformers. Now, what are monad transformers? Just now all the monads actually have a, have a, have an interesting uh, use case is that they are all ap applied to one particular type of monad. That means it's either all of these computations return me an option like this. like this, option, 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 or something else like a list, a list, a list, a list, if you can imagine. Mona transformers is to allow you to combine different things together. Let me go through. Okay, so Mona transformers. Oh. Okay, this is gonna be a tough one. So let's say we, let's, uh, I, normally I try to look at the problem and see how it can be applied and try to derive some understanding from that. So if we look at, so let's say we have a problem statement, we say that we have a cat. We wanna find out whether it's alive. Either it's alive or it's not alive. But in order to find out whether the cat is alive, I need to determine whether I can actually find the cat, right? Okay, so there's this case class, a fictitious case class that represents a cat. And then I have a very simple function that says, is it, a, is it alive? So, ah, oh, crap, caught me. There was a typo. This is supposed to be a cat. <laughs> so if there was a cat, if it is a lie, then you return a right. And I would say that it's a two option. That means it's uh, some cat that is a lie. If not, I would say it's, it's dead. Then I would say it's, you go to the left because it's, it's dead. And I, then this, because try and exception always return you a none. So it will be a list of nothing. So. Now, when you evaluate, when you do a lookup, so this cat is very simple. It just basically says, uh, look up a cat, and this cat is always alive, and it will always return me some cat in a list. This is regular Scala syntax. And then, this is how it normally looks like if you don't use a Monarch transformer. Again, you notice I favor the four comprehension style. I will do something like this. I have to do something like this. Look up, give me a cat, and I can't, I can't compute it on the same expression. I have to go inside the yield and then do this. Now, when you have a lot of these different types of functions, it becomes a headache because this yield will keep nesting. You can imagine it keeps nesting. So the Mona transformers, what it does for you is that you just need to tell me what is the sort of the hole I'm going to deal with, and I will help you deal with that. So what it does is here. The only difference between the previous code and this one is that this is an option transformer. Uh, this one is slightly more uh, um, of a problematic if you haven't done cats enough, in a sense. What this type basically means, this refers to the type here. That means it's looking out for the most inner type, while the outer type is left unknown. The reason for the, as far as I know, the reason for the existence of monad transformers is because monads in general cannot compose. So when I try to nest them, they can't compose because the, there's one layer, the outer layer, which is always unknown. I, I don't know whether I'm getting a list of something or is, it, or is it a list of lists of something? I never know. So what they did, so they call this thing the hole. They, rep, they took out this whole thing, this, this hole, and replaced it with a generic type parameter and they operate based on the inside. In this case, in this expression, the inside is actually a sum. 
So, yeah, it's, yeah, it will take a while. <laughs> so your head is going to hurt. So you have to say, oh, I know the most inner, the type of the most inner expression is going to be a sum. And I want to operate on those values. You have to give me an option transformer. Using this kind of construction, you need to know the pattern. You can write it like this. The yield is no longer nested. You, you basically lift everything up into the same four comprehension. Right? Okay. I don't like to do it that way. So I found another way. It's called the F monarch. F monarch, uh, that's the link over there. Uh, I know Eric Tobo uh, is one of the key uh, contributors to the project. It is an alternative to the monarch transformers. Okay, How, what do I mean by alternative? Uh, before I go over there. So previously, right, all these transformers, exact, uh, what they basically did in the F monarch is that they lift out all this common stuff, the either, the option, uh, future, eval, what else? There were a few others. They lift everything out and make it into a library so that you can write code like this, effectively like this. It's called the F monarch, okay? So that's why it's called an alternative to the uh, F monarch. So I'm going to give you an example. Uh, maybe you remember this code. So our old project used to have this idea of a workflow uh, descriptor. We wrote, uh, we basically, uh, before the workflow uh, needs to start, right, we need to persist the descriptor of a workflow. Uh, we tell you what's the workflow ID, where to go, get the data types, et cetera, et cetera. But that's not really the main story. What we did was that we persisted uh, this thing, and then we need to lift it up from storage and then um, pass the whole descriptor so that it becomes uh, uh, readable, right? Now, in F monads, you can deal with I.O. You can read data off from storage, etc., and then compose them together. So what you need to do is basically, you need to have all this regular, uh, this, this particular import over here. And I'm using the uh, success uh, JSON parser. So this is, the, the most important thing you should focus is these types over here. These represent what are the potential kind of errors I will face when I'm reading a descriptor off from the disk. This represents whether I can read, uh, read basically the descriptor itself, and whether uh, this is basically represents the logging. That means when I'm reading, I want to log each step of my uh, computation itself. And because the, re the descriptor is in a JSON format, I need to have a passing and a coding failure to represent these kind of things. So how do they piece together? This is the F monad. What it does, let's walk through step by step. First of all, I know what are the sequences, I, uh, what are the steps I need to do. First of all, I need to go find out where this uh, descriptor is on the disk. I need to read, I need to attempt to read it. And then after reading it, I need to attempt to pass it. And then after I pass it, I will have to construct it into a workflow. Uh, um, basically, it's a, it's a case class, basically. So what I need to do, I want to model this whole thing into a, in, in, into a again, my favorite for comprehension because it's basically flat mapping. So what I do, first of all, um, you need to describe what is the type of this effect. All the types you've seen in the previous slide refers to this. This is a notation, uh, basically a type notation, uh, which lives in the implicit uh, that says, uh, this computation here is expecting six kind of effects, six kind of different type of monads, uh, monads. Um, and I basically list everything down over here. The next thing is I go and describe my computation, what I want to do. I say that the purpose of this function is to load the descriptor. I will get, um, I need to enter a descriptor, and I'll return you a workflow. So over here, this is refers to, that means I ask, this function, once you, once you create it, right? Once you create it, you can actually run it. So if I, if I say that the descriptor is a number called one, maybe we saw it as just the number one, for example, and then with a, pref, uh, with a suffix called one dot uh, txt, for example, you can think of it like this. So 
when you construct this computation and then I run it, I know that one becomes the value of this ask itself. Because I know that it's a string. This is a string. So I, I'm, what I'm saying is that go read the workflow descriptor call number one on the disk. And then tell is actually a function inside the writer mona itself. So what you're saying is that, oh, you can notice that I'm actually uh, giving a timestamp of when I'm reading it. So the next thing is basically, oh, can I load the contents? I'm trying to uh, do an I.O. and load it off. If I, uh, the load contents is the function returns a left or a right. And you have this thing called the either effect. So that's it. That's in F mona. So all these functions are being written for you already, pre-packaged, and you can construct your logic. The logic basically represents the idea of asking the low, uh, workflow descriptor, giving this uh, ID, I do logging at each step, and I try to load, and I try to pass. For example, once I finish loading, because it's a monad, you will only reach this step, that means the next step, if this one is valid. Contents, then I start to pass. And then I say that I'm passing, and then I try to decode. So. This kind of uh, fmonads, basically the library itself, helps, uh, helps you to write, to express your logic as clearly as you possibly can with a minimum of, uh, I don't know, headaches in a sense. Yeah. Why? Yes, yeah, sorry. Yeah. So, tells basically only tell if something goes, if mm. everything goes okay, right? Yeah. If something goes wrong, what's written in the log? What would uh, I mean, how would you do, how would you log error condition, error messages? So, uh, if I can remember correctly, so if let's say there's a, um, at a particular step that the logging sort of, I mean the previous operation fails, right? You can actually use this as kind of expression to lift out what was the last thing that you saw mm -hmm. so by doing this thing called run writer. Okay, so yeah. basically you only get a list of successful messages up until the last yep. successful query. Yep. So it's very convenient for me, yeah. in a sense. Yeah, it's convenient. I tend to, to, to need those exceptions. <laughs> yeah, um, I remember uh, when I was at Scala Mastery, Powell was uh, saying one thing which was sort of lodged in my, into my head. He said, when he joined a particular company, he, the only thing that the team lead gave him, the only task he was being given was how to write, uh, read a, um, a file with the data inside. He, uh, he basically said, just focus on that problem. So he, actually he solved the problem using uh, FMONA, but he wasn't very satisfied. So he went about uh, writing this thing for a recursion scheme. Uh, and then he talked about recursion scheme. About, uh, that, that was what got me interested. But, you know, so... To be able to write like this, you basically, it's like falling back to what Powell was, was talking about. That means breaking down the logic, focusing on each step of the particular task, reading it. How can you, how can you like, you know, how can you assume that a disk, you know, is readable? It, you know, it may be a, a network connected uh, disk, for example. Yeah. So, yeah. So, FMONAT allows you to do really nice stuff, in a sense. Because it's a, it's a very nice monad transformer that's written in a very simple syntax and most of it is uh, borrowed from CATS itself. Yep. The key thing uh, to remember about F monads is it allows you to stack. Stack all your computations. Okay? Okay, so we are nearing the end of the talk, which I don't know whether did I have enough time or not. But here are some uh, good learning uh, resources. Uh, this is the Gitter channel. Uh, yeah. So, yeah, interesting fellas over there. So, this is uh, Runa's blog. So, Runa is, uh, is one of the co authors for this book called Functional Programming in Scala. Uh, very smart guy. Uh, type level. Uh, I advise you to go read up this one. Uh, this is basically Eugene Yokota's uh, links to herding cats. He has a similar website called Herding Scala Z, if you want to learn about Scala Z. The format between the two uh, is really similar. So, you know, yeah. And last one, uh, the top one is actually on, on Monats itself. I find this to be pretty helpful. 
I'm not asking you to go learn Haskell itself, but I find that it has a lot of benefits uh, by understanding uh, how Haskell function. Because the guys who wrote Scala Z and Cats mostly were from Haskell, so they borrowed a lot of the concepts from there. Okay, that's it for me. Any questions? What is the matrix? The what? The matrix. The matrix? Yes. But, but <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah. Do you know why Tycho started working on cats if they were Scala Z already? And if I were to start a new project, why should I choose one or the other? Oh, okay. Hmm. As far as I know, Type Labo, right, it's basically a non profit organization. The guys are generally very friendly. So uh, uh, I probably, it, it, if you, if you want to do a lot of the hardcore stuff uh, in functional programming, which I'm, I'm not, because I'm just trying to you know, churn code, in a sense, in a nicer way. So you can actually try learning uh, Scala Z itself, because the guys actually pushed Scala Z to the edge. Whatever the theory is out last year from the ICFP, you probably can find an implementation inside Scala Z. So if you want to go for really cutting edge, probably Scala Z is a, is a, is a, it's, it's a good thing. But so if you want to do like uh, cats, actually, I think it's a good uh, community because uh, the ecosystem is expanding. There's this guy called Daniel Spivak. Daniel Spivak decided to bring in about this thing called cats IO, I think, or effects. I can't remember. But it's basically trying to model the IO component. Uh, that means like, for example, uh, performing asynchronous computations, reading data of uh, uh, persistent storage from Hadoop, uh, from big data stores, etc. There's a lot of projects under the type level that are participating in this effort. One, if you're interested, uh, like Rob Norris. Rob Norris is uh, he's a very nice guy. So uh, he wrote this thing called Doobie. So if you're into SQL, uh, you want to find a replacement for Slick. If you, for example, if you hate Slick, you can, you can try out Doobie. Maybe Doobie works for you. Uh, yeah. So if you ask me, um, I say the same thing to my manager. Scala Z is now maintained by only one guy, Kenji. So Kenji Yoshida, I mean, he's a great guy, but it's, he's really just one guy. And a lot of the uh, efforts from, the, uh, from um, the open source is moving towards the CATS direction, simply because there's a lot, much larger community over there. They sort of swing over. Um, I, I don't think they're pushing people actively, you know. Oh, so you read the mailing list. So it's a uh, uh, Scala Z. Uh -huh. They used to have a voice come out, so they're not really associated at all. Okay. And I know that there's an effort. Well, at least uh, that's what I went to. Uh, uh, I went to a cafe with somebody who asked that last year. Uh, I said that. And a lot of cafe uh, projects, like the Moon League, the Drive, but uh, the direction was to adopt cats. Uh, yeah. So, I mean, I would say, you know, I've been using Scala Z for like the last four years. So if oh, okay. I about it, it's like, I, I love that, you know, the library. And when I look at cats, it's basically, you know, like a lot of it is saying, like, uh, but given that uh, the effort is made towards cats, I mean, like, wouldn't we, uh, if, well, uh, we discuss whether we should use Scala Z or uh, cats, uh, if maybe we should just use cats, mainly because. Uh, we know that there's active development, and yep. yeah, because for example, I think Tony Morris, who basically started more Scala Z stuff, I don't, I don't think he's contributing to Scala Z. Anymore. Yeah. You, you probably know uh, Paul Chusano now is, is off doing his own stuff, a consultancy. Uh, Runa started Tech T. It's a high school house with Gabriel Gonzalez. These two high school gods, you know, they're like somewhere there. But never mind. These, these guys are really, you know, really nice guys. But uh, so basically, uh, it's like echoing your point. The main guys have moved off. Tony, not sure. He, there was a big hoo-ha about, uh, I don't want to get into that. But there was a big hoo-ha about uh, uh, Scala Z. Yeah. Yes. Uh, 
the community is nicer. Uh, they create the for the code of conduct so that people do not behave badly. Uh, and also, it's got nice communication. Um, so I think, in, yeah, yeah. So in terms of what's there, what, in terms of code, I don't think it's so different. Um, so if, you, if you're asking whether it's more, one is more functional or not, I don't think that's clear. I think it's just more the case that, uh, I think it became too much to do start to continue to start as a development because the people are so community within the community and people found it's probably easier to come move on to and start something new. But that seems to be kind of the They are also the the pollution of the um, catches because this high level they are doing the stuff into the compiler to fix the things in the compiler that they have functional programming or working on the Yeah, I, I think uh, uh, by Simon, as uh, uh, Sat uh, managed, he uh, did one thing, and um, so this is with uh, uh, a high level. So basically, the problem is that you give it, you trying to do a high level um, uh, programming in uh, The problem is that it is, it's, uh, you have to, at some point, you have to use high blender um, to specify, you know, to. Uh, to kind of, uh, I don't know what you yep. do, like, right? also, if you have, like, say, type, and it takes type one time, you can't say that, okay, I want to actually say, you know, I want to click it in one group of so you have to do, like, type lambda, which is really nasty. So, yeah, I think, I think there's a lot of work made into that. I think, ideally, that should export to the Scala compiler rather than having to uh, use the compiler plugin, because then, like, you have to tell them no, no, to use the uh, I mean, they used to have a uh, plugin, right? But now they have, well, it's, it's a fork. But the goal that they have stated publicly is that all the things that they put into the formula at some point want into the main scanner. I don't know, I don't know, yeah. yeah. Well, that, that's yeah. what they say in the uh, talk. I, I think that's actually and why. You say that you have some issues that disappear in 2.11.8, right? Because uh, yeah. the public was yeah. the time. Yeah, so Miles Sabian came out with a fix uh, to sort of unify the types to a certain extent by a compiler plugin. So it's, I think it was necessary for 2.11.8 if you want to use CATS with that Scala version. But I didn't find that I need to use it from uh, that point onwards. It was okay. Yep. But. Just like that compiler, yeah. uh, that level of contribution, it does sort of form one of the conditions that, you know, whatever you're going to. If you're going to make a pull request to that level of compiler, you know, it's going to get uh, pushed for the official or the fact of the style scene. Yeah, he's a, he's a contributor to Dot D. No, no, no. Uh, <laughs> uh, but yeah, look, uh, think of the top level one as the bleeding edge. And not to be using the right uh, yeah. uh, uh, type of libraries, then, you know, they might be better. Yep. Yep. Just to give you an example, uh, Dotty has this idea of a union type. You can say uh, A or B, literally using a pipe. In Scala, you can't do that. I spent like a week writing my own algebra to emulate this thing. I was like, oh my god. <laughs> so I'm looking forward to Dotty actually, to solving the problem for me. <coughs> yeah, but uh, yeah. yeah. Hey, any other questions? No? Okay, cool. <laughs>